All right, you guys ready to get started? All right, All right uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, first, uh, before we introduce ourselves, I'd like to, by a show of hands, uh, ask how many people are new to OpenStack in the room? Anyone? Uh, how about uh, CICD implementation? Are you guys working on one? Because we're looking for a back and forth dialogue today, and we're also going to uh, demonstrate kind of our journey along the way in trying to implement a CICD solution. and kind of the needs that we have and why we, we started on this path um, and some of the tool sets that are available to you all as well uh, in trying to implement this. Um, my name is uh, Vic Howard. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Comcast uh, cloud team, uh, cloud services team. Uh, I'm Sridhar Basim. I'm the lead engineer for Comcast uh, OpenStack team. Hi, I'm uh, Prashant Hari. I'm a senior engineer in the Comcast cloud team. So we're going to talk about t uh, three things today. Uh, first, how do you design a CI/CD process and a workflow that works for your organization? Uh, let's give some real-world examples for you so you can kind of see what it looks like, uh, what we've implemented, and, and it's kind of a work in progress, and we can show you uh, what, where we're going, uh, where we've been, kind of the difficulties we've faced with it, what worked really well, what didn't, uh, and then we'll go into some technical details in the end to try to really drill into kind of architecture diagrams some more implementation details, but we're going to try to keep it somewhat high level to give you kind of an introduction and, and let you know that you're not alone in trying to implement this stuff. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of take an inventory of where you're at. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe you already have some kind of manual process in place where you're deploying software. Um, just find out where you are and then find out what a working CI CD system for you would be. Uh, maybe you want automated deployment. Maybe you're not so concerned about automated deployment, but you want to, to speed your code uh, into production. Um, let me take one step back and talk a little bit about kind of our environment. We, we actually carry some patches uh, that we'd like implemented in our version of OpenStack that may not have made it to the upstream yet. So we do hold a number of patches uh, until they're in the upstream, but we focus on trying to get our code into the upstream. Um, so I think... What, what worked well for us was building a workflow, actually whiteboarding a workflow of what our CI CD system was, and then how long things are taking, and maybe the pain points uh, during that workflow when we first etched it out. Um, in addition, I think you should make sure that you look at a minimum viable product. Even if there's manual processes involved in like taking, taking code and pushing it into production, go ahead and mark it down and, and look at the most painful and time-consuming portions of that workflow. Focus on those first and, and try to iterate over those uh, every couple weeks. Um, so I think also it's very important to leverage existing infrastructure that the community provides. Uh, we've used a lot of different things from the community as well as things that other people have turned us on to, like pBuilder. Uh, Jenkins, uh, we, we also uh, use workers or, or nodes with Jenkins. So we can do many different things at once. We're not tied to just one uh, master orchestration engine. We also use uh, rep repo to manage our, our uh, repository, and we use dupload to get there. Uh, we're big into testing and using Puppet to implement and push our QA and produ production environments. Uh, we'll go into that in a little bit. And then the things that we really don't use internally are Azul, uh, Node Pool, Jenkins Job Builder, and Garrett. Uh, we've been looking a lot into implementing Jenkins Job Builder, though. Um, so, where do we start? Well, we had less than five data centers, and um, we, we started to realize that as we were going to scale up these data centers, we are going to have to put more and more automation around our process. It was taking us more time than we'd like to actually push things into production. Actually, we have a goal of within two weeks of a milestone release, getting that into our production environment and doing it in the most autom automated way that we can. Uh, the things that worked really well for us was, I mean, Jenkins was great as an orchestration tool, uh, tying everything together. We really enjoyed it. Uh, a lot of the um, default puppet manifests that we got from the community were great. Uh, just minor tweaks or just l us learning, that was the only real blocker for us in implementing that. Um, Tempest testing, I mean, leverage that. Uh, the community's using Tempest. We use Tempest. We think it's really good for functional testing above and beyond unit testing when you deploy something. Um, Community is great. Uh, there's a couple of IRC channels uh, that, I'll, that I'll give you at the end of the presentation. And feel free to, to reach out to us or talk to anybody 
in the community. Uh, tons of people that are, that are willing to help. Uh, IRC is great. Um, I've reached out to several people in, in different organizations, uh, talked about their issues, our issues. It's really, really nice uh, collaboration and definitely leverage that as you're starting, <coughs> starting out of trying to improve your process. Um, and defining workflow. I think uh, when we set out just defining the workflow and actually putting it on, on a whiteboard or on paper uh, really helped us to see, well, we're not even thinking about this portion or we missed this piece. It really helped us come up with kind of a roadmap for what we're trying to do. Uh, wh what went bad when we started out? Well, um, we didn't have a lot of uh, standards. Like we didn't have one consistent place we were putting all of our code in. We didn't have a naming con convention for our code versus upstream code. Uh, those type of things don't sound like much in the beginning, but they can really come back to bite you if you're trying to automate and have a consistent deployment mechanism, a consi consistent way you're taking source uh, in, in a production, especially if you're carrying your own packages. Uh, packaging was really difficult for us as well, um, mainly because um, we really didn't know what to do as far as uh, we had no experience with Debian configs, uh, not a lot of experience with Debian in general. Uh, as far as packaging up OpenStack and deploying it. Uh, the community was very helpful there. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, configs on Launchpad that we leveraged. Uh, so we'd pull those down. We'd have to modify our change log, uh, modify some things in the configs, which is kind of a manual process, uh, and, then, and then push that out. Um, we've, we've also uh, got a lot of manual processes that we were dealing with in, in the beginning, um, mainly around uh, where do we gate, uh, Deploying QA, uh, very manual. Uh, deploying production, very manual process. Um, even triggering uh, CI to build. Uh, triggering builds from Jenkins was a manual process in the beginning. Um, also, managing our, our build host that we use for packaging. The nodes that I was talking about earlier on Jenkins. Uh, we were using Vagrant and Puppet Librarian. Um, that was kind of our best solution early on to uh, kind of prepare like an Essex environment or a, a Grizzly environment or Havana to be able to then run those unit tests for packaging on. And it was it became really difficult to manage that. Very time consuming. Um, so, you know, we had a 5x growth last year. I mean, 500% 500, 500 growth in our data centers. And we really knew that we needed to automate more about the way that we artifacted code, the way that we put it all together. Um, so the things that worked really well for us, and uh, I see Chris sitting here, uh, P Builder. He turned me on to P Builder. Uh, that was really helpful for us because it segmented our builds and allowed us to use one unified build host. Whereas before we had to manage them all with, you know, Vagrant and Puppet Librarian. It's very taxing. Uh, we parameterized Jenkins and came up with with consistent tagging mechanisms for our, for our co for our code for the patches that we held. Um, this. This is really key in, in, in the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. In the beginning, we were using manual updates to Jenkins to change our code location, which is a big no-no. Um, but in tagging things consistently and having the same naming convention for the internal Debian configs we were, we were holding, we were able to automate our Jenkins job. So no one has to update anything in Jenkins anymore. Instead, instead we look to our source uh, location have a drop down with all of the tags, and those tags match our configs. So that's really saved us a lot of time and sped things up. Um, we still have uh, a lot of manual processes involved in deploying. Uh, even though the system is automated, we have to trigger it manually. We, we have a lot of configurations, and um, Sridhar will go into that later. Um, and we need more testing. I mean. I think when, when you're looking at the big picture, what you have to ask yourself is, do I feel comfortable just using this system to push source even into QA or into production automatically? And that should be kind of you know, the final point that you're at. Just, I feel comfortable using this system and not doing anything manual. At least for us, that's, that's our goal. So the more testing we have in place, the better. All right, let's take, take a look at how everything looks. This, this is what we kind of thought CICD would look like when we got started. Just, we didn't know. You know, it sounds so big, right? It, and we thought, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we'll get some CICD from open source and we'll just implement that. But I think what we found out it was that, 
you know, everybody's a little bit different and everybody has different needs in their business. And then, uh, <laughs> and for us, uh, it, it really came down to uh, figuring out what we needed uh, and trying to learn how to tie everything together. So this diagram here kind of shows the big picture of, of our current state of implementation. We have uh, developers that are contributing to upstream. Um, they also uh, rebase off of milestone releases to carry patches when we have to. Uh, we then grab down the Debian configs and using Jenkins and pBuilder, um, we, we build those artifacts. Uh, at that point, we reach out the community, bundle together the same community version that we need with our local patches, and then they're available for Puppet and for Cobbler to provision our QA and production systems. I'm going to go ahead and hand over to pro, uh, Prashant now. He's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the way that we manage our uh, artifacts in our app repo. Thanks, Richard. Hey, I'm uh, Prashant Harry, uh, senior engineer in Comcast. So I'm going to talk about um, artifacting and what our approach was in um, building and uh, integrating all the artifacts. And uh, I'll also cover um, what our approach was on um, setting this up. And I may have some two minutes of uh, demo on Tempest gating if based on the time, respecting the time. So um, to get started, like, what is artifacting, basically? So artifacts can be, uh, in the layman's term, like artifacts can be any piece of work that is completed, right? It, any tangible <coughs> piece of work. So when you map this to the same software concepts, it can be like uh, a piece, I mean, a software that is ready for deployment. It can be like, I mean, um, a source code. It can also be um, a package that is ready for uh, deployment. So um, the context of this presentation, like, uh, by artifacting, we mean like the OpenStack source code. It, we also mean uh, any packages uh, relating to OpenStack or any other dependent packages that's going to be deployed in the target production nodes. So, so if you see here, like uh, we need to s identify the problem, right? The problem. Uh, so, what are we talking about? So, the, the problem is like it's to uh, to deploy uh, OpenStack, open stack itself, which is a complex problem, like. Uh, uh, we need to first like um, uh, um, create that into packages, right? And we need to be we need to keep up with, uh, with the releases. And um, it's it's not just OpenStack we are deploying. So we need to we need to carry along few other things. So basically, it can be um, patches. You might also have like uh, system management tools, monitoring tools, and all these needs to be in sync. We have to um, integrate it basically, and then also um, make sure that I mean we uh, we uh, we are consistent on every releases. So there are two challenges which we face, right? I mean, so we have all the community releases, the open, I mean, the Havana, I mean, SX, Havana, Grizzly, and all those things. But uh, we internally to Comcast, we wanted to uh, keep in touch with, I mean, uh, we need to be in sync with that. So um, we need to have, like, uh, uh, um, internally, like, we have to take all this code. We need to consistently, like, uh, um, integrate all our internal baseline packages and then uh, Go, uh, go along, and then we need to also create packages for target operating systems like Ubuntu or Red Hat and uh, deploy to target locations. So this was our uh, problem, basically, we are trying to solve. So, um, so our approach to this problem, like uh, as Victor mentioned, like uh, we took a minimum viable product approach. Uh, our journey to op in OpenStack began from uh, SX onwards. So when we initially uh, deployed SX, um, so uh, we are kind of in dark, right? I mean, we we, uh, we we knew that. I mean, we wanted to do a continuous integration, but the the entire solution evolved. Even now, we are evolving, kind of thing. So we are evolving, and uh, the initially, like the, the what we the, the strategy which we adopted was that SX is the first playground on OpenStack internal. So we wanted to get a feel of how the OpenStack entire thing works. We started with SX, and then. Um, um, we identified all our internal tools. Um, that was kind of pretty much easy because we know like what tools internal to Comcast we have like a set of standard that needs to be deployed in the production environment. So that's where we began. We had like our internal um, uh, uh, package repositories. Uh, the only challenge we had was that I mean most of our systems were um, based on like Red Hat based. Um, uh, we had we spent considerable of time like converting all our internal tools to dev files because our OpenStack production. Uh, runs on Ubuntu, Ubuntu Precise. 
So that was our first strategy on that. And then um, <coughs> for uh, OpenStack uh, SX packages, we were directly using uh, the external app sources. Um, so that was our uh, first venture into this. So when, uh, when we moved on to Grizzly and uh, Havana, we had, um, that's the first time like when we were kind of uh, rolling out uh, our internal patches. Uh, so we, we had to patch our Keystone uh, deployment. We also had to patch our Horizon. So um, th so th that's when like we, we identified that we need to have like, uh, because the, 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 uh, the SX environment, we are kind of directly using the external OpenStack cloud archive um, dev file. So we didn't have any control on these patches, right? I mean, so when we, ha when we deploy these patches internally, uh, the, uh, the upstream packages was changing. So we needed some way to host these packages internally. Uh, so when we started with Grizzly, we decided like, uh, let's set up a partial mirror from Cloud Archive and then deploy it internally. So that was the phase two. And um, we started um, um, downloading all, all the external packages, dependencies, and then created like PPAs for OpenStack releases. Um, we introduced Jenkins for continuous integration, um, uh, built automations. I'm, I'm coming to the workflow um, after I this, I'm going to, I'll show you like what, what's our current solution. So, um, so we had uh, automations uh, that uh, Jenkins would call for uh, building, uh, kickstarting the um, artifacting and con uh, CI process. Um, <coughs> so in ISOs, um, uh, we are in a kind of, uh, um, uh, I'd say like in a good shape on CI CD. We have um, automated builds and workflows, and uh, uh, we, uh, we have also introduced like uh, pack, uh, filtering upstream packages from multiple LTS repositories and other uh, external subsystems. And um, for ISOs, we are also doing like uh, production gate tests uh, using Tempest. Um, uh, so uh, we, we have integrated uh, Tempest with um, Gearman job server. And Juno and Kilo, uh, we would like to uh, leverage uh, Rally for um, benchmark tests, and uh, we, uh, we are also kind of uh, enhancing our um, artifacting, um, the, the app repositories to use object store as backend. So for, uh, so um, the tools we are currently using for artifacting, like uh, uh, um, RepRepro is used for package management, and uh, Germinate is for, uh, we use Germinate and some automations around Germinate to uh, verify package dependencies. So on each releases, like whether it is um, ISOs, Juno, or Kilo, like I mean, we had some kind of um, um, criteria-based filtering, which uses uh, um, uh, uses Germinate uh, to get all the packages from upstream OpenStack. Uh, and Puppet uh, uh, is our configuration management. Uh, we use Puppet for deploying into pr um, production. So, uh, <coughs> so this is our uh, workflow. Um, so as uh, uh, Victor mentioned in the earlier slides, um, we have um, uh, the P builder generating all our internal custom patches. And uh, we are, um, uh, so it, uh, after the P builder process is complete, uh, D upload up, uh, uploads our patches to the um, artifact, uh, artifacting nodes. The one you see, the PPA nodes. That's where all our uh, CI, automation and all the uh, package repositories exist. Uh, so once uh, uh, once the patches are created uh, using pbuilder, the CI job would invoke um, like a build CI, it's a Python script, and uh, it, would, it would kick off the, uh, the, uh, the process for uh, setting up the, uh, building the entire releases. So uh, internally what's happening is like build CI uh, uh, uses, uh, calls the filter packages. Filter packages, we, ha we have set up configuration files where to know what all dependencies are there for different OpenStack releases. It downloads that and also it, it creates like, um, it, uh, we didn't want to complicate this basically. So we, we, um, we wanted to make it pretty much uh, self-contained repositories, like app repositories. So um, uh, uh, what we did was like, um, uh, the, the for every OpenStack releases, we create like a timestamp based um, uh, uh, PPA uh, repository, and that would have that would host all the uh, upstream uh, packages and all the patches, and also all our Comcast internal tools. So the advantage what we have here is like um, once we have this setup uh, during the production gating. Um, uh, so if you wanted to do like uh, when you do gate tests, uh, we can um, we just have to pick up. I mean, just cherry pick that particular uh, timestamp releases, and then we can start doing the gate tests. 
so currently in, in our uh, production gating, we are, we are kind of um, uh, using both manual testing as well as uh, Tempest. Uh, the workflow for Yeah, so, um, <coughs> so the gate, uh, um, so w w what we have basically is like, uh, so once the, once the, uh, the packages, the QA packages are created, Jenkins, uh, so uh, we, are, we are using the Tempest uh, uh, community uh, um, code, but I mean, we did some wrap, we built uh, more automations on um, Tempest, uh, basically like we, we have like a set of Tempest clients that would invoke test and then, um, um, uh, send it to a Gearman uh, job server. We have uh, workers, and then workers would subscribe to Gearman and then perform the test. Thus, uh, run the tests to the OpenStack uh, at the production endpoint. We, uh, and uh, also, like, I mean, we can do like, um, um, uh, in the la we have like QA um, um, uh, gating tests. It, uh, so the test, we basically, like, the, the uh, Tempest client sends the region information where the test needs to be done. Worker subscribes that, performs the tests on the target node, sends back the result, and saves the result in Mongo. So I'm going to show you like a two-minute, I mean, short demo on uh, on this, so to get a feel of it. So we did. So basically, the automations which we did was um, the back end. The worker is basically running the same uh, Tempest uh, run, uh, the nose test and the run test. That's what it's doing. The worker. Um, we we had a lot of I mean. Um, um, uh, it was pretty much challenging for us to do this. I mean, uh, we, we simplified a lot of simplification. We did a lot of simpli um, uh, simplified the solution. Um, we had to spend like a lot of hours, like I mean, identifying uh, the tempest configuration. Right? I mean, uh, the if you say like the tempest configuration is pretty much complicated, and we wanted to know um, which configuration works for us. So we had to spend like a lot of hours uh, tweaking the tempest configuration files and. Uh, um, uh, so we uh, so we had basically like I mean have a, a, a template Tempest configuration template and all the, the the Tempest client what it does is it's just going to pass the uh, region information and we already have like the configuration file that works for us and during runtime it creates the configuration file and executes the test and uh, um, sends back the result to Jenkins. So yeah. We, uh, So uh, this, I mean, the, the workflow which I explained, this is a short two-minute demo. Uh, we have the Tempest uh, client that is, uh, normally it's executed in the uh, Jenkins. Uh, for the demo's sake, I mean, uh, we are running it manually. So that's the uh, worker that uh, that's waiting for request to be sent. Uh, so the Jenkins has sent, uh, st uh, invoked a test, and it has also passed the region information where the test needs to be executed. So um, yeah, so the, the test has kicked off and um, started creating images. So um, yeah, basically we, we had to patch most of these uh, tests. Some of the tests didn't work for us because in our, um, I'll come to the challenges later, but. Uh, So we are also storing the test uh, um, the performance data so that we could we could feed that back to our um, uh, KPI tools which we have um, internal to Comcast and also we could do yeah so um, yeah did the test it sent back the result um, and it's also saving the data in uh, the, uh, in a time series we are basically using uh, Mongo we are also using the same tool for our operational um, dashboards um, and. The idea is also we are also uh, using the same tool for um, periodic health checks on our production setup. So now coming to the uh, challenges we had on Tempest. Um, uh, so uh, I think everyone knows that I mean Tempest is a valuable tool. So um, but making it work was um, was a real tough task for us. Uh, so we uh, we had to spend like a lot, lot of hours to make it work. Some of the tests, one of some of the community scenario tests, didn't uh, work out of the box for us because our setup uh, uh, used multi-regions, and we are also using provider networks. Um, 
so when we initially rolled this out, um, the, the scenario tests, um, the region configuration, so uh, uh, the, service, uh, uh, the service definitions in this Tempest uh, configuration file, even though we mentioned the region information, that was not getting picked up. So I think that that has changed in the current version of uh, Tempest. Um, so they have already, the community has already merged the, the, the service uh, the client as well as, the, as, as well as the Tempest client has been merged to a single uh, namespace. So that is fixed now. But I mean, we, when we are rolling it out, that didn't work. And for um, um, uh, for the uh, multi, um, but for the for the provider network, uh, there is already um, <coughs> a um, Tempest scenario test which is under review. So we are we currently we are testing this internally, we, but we are also running a patched version of it. So, so if, uh, any of you like are uh, uh, testing in your environment if you are using uh, provider network, I'd suggest like I mean to review this code. Um, I think it's it, it works and. Uh, Please vote and vote on that uh, uh, tempest uh, scenario test. So, can you? Yeah. So, uh, just to put things together, um, uh, so we had the um, uh, gate tests. That's what I demoed now. I mean, we had the automated tempest tests, and then the uh, once that automated tempest tests are uh, completed. Um, we uh, so uh, so we have cherry picked one particular I mean a specific uh, QA build, and that QA build would be promoted to a production repository like a golden repository, and that repository is what will be deployed into a production node. So, uh, with that, I'm, I'm passing on to uh, Sridhar. He's going to talk about um, how th the packages are deployed from the uh, production um, um, repositories. He's going to talk about the puppet. And Thank you, Prashant. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to be covering the deployment phase of uh, uh, the RCI/CD uh, pipeline. Uh, we we use a bunch of tools. We use Cobbler as there are two there are, <coughs> there are two phases to the deployment process. The first is actually getting an OS provisioned on the nodes, and the second one is actually configuring OpenStack services to run on the nodes once the operating system has been installed. Um, so we use Cobbler as our imaging API. Uh, we drive Cobbler through Puppet and uh, Hera. We have an internal data model for us to uh, for us to uh, uh, kind of define how an OpenStack region looks like, and all of that information is then replicated for different regions. So our manifests are all the same across all regions, and then the data portion is what changes between regions. Um, so the first step uh, during installation, uh, when, when you cobbler a node, you need to know some information about the node. You need like the MAC address, you need to enable option ROM, or you need to um, uh, change the boot order so that uh, Pixie is the first one that starts. So uh, we do this uh, using uh, a bunch of scripts. Depending on your hardware, some of this can be got through IPMI. Um, uh, other times you have to use the vendor specific uh, auto bad management API to get, get this information. Um, like Vic and Prashant mentioned, we are uh, Debian based. We use Ubuntu, Precise, and Trusty. Uh, trust, we're currently testing Trusty. Uh, production is mostly Precise. Uh, we use a pre-seed based installation. Um, I'll talk about a little bit about our challenges with using the pre-seed based versus like where we're going in the future. Um, and then, uh, we have different profiles depending on the function of the nodes. So our storage nodes would have uh, more disks, uh, more memory, and might be like slower CPUs. And our compute nodes typically have uh, a, a fewer disks, local disks, uh, or SSD back net, uh, disks in case uh, we need FML storage, which is fast. Uh, and depending on that, we create pre-seeds uh, uh, to match the flavor that we want to uh, deploy. No, the, the, so th that's the current phase. So in the future, what we want to get to is um, not have to do so much disk manual discovery. Even though it's scripted, somebody has to run that script and then kind of feed that data into our here data model and then generate that uh, configuration. What, what we're going towards, and some of this is already in flight, uh, we have an internal configuration management database which tracks the entire lifecycle of hardware and the OpenStack configuration too. Um, so the, the configuration management database 
uh, when a new node comes up, detects that I if it doesn't know it, it automatically provisions it with uh, a tiny RAM kernel for it to do discovery. So we discovered that information and then put it back into our configuration management database. And then at that point, we know what the node looks like in terms of hardware, number of disks, uh, memory, CPU, everything. And then an engineer or operator can then define what that node's purpose is within OpenStack. Like if they want it to be a controller, an API node, or if it's a storage node. Um, so once, uh, we, we also, so I mentioned like our issues with pre-seed. One of the things we had with SX when we were using upstream repos is um, the upstream Ubuntu rep repositories, like they, they update packages regularly. And so when we have a node which dies, like you have like a uh, root drive which crashes, you gotta rebuild that node. You, you don't want it to be different from every other node within your cluster. So what we found was like, there were subtle changes in the, AP in the way like the SX APIs work, like in a later package, and that caused issues for us. So that's the reason why we now uh, host all of those Debian's internally. Um, and then when we deploy it, uh, we deploy against that internal Debian repo for OpenStack service, uh, Debian's, and everything else comes from uh, upstream. Uh, like I mentioned, the hardware lifecycle management, so when the node first comes in, <coughs> don't know anything about it, we do some discovery, automated discovery, pulls that information back, then it, it goes to the next phase, which is, um, uh, uh, which is hardware burn-in. So <coughs> we wanna discover hardware issues uh, early in the process rather than like after, once you've uh, installed it and like deployed it to production. Uh, once it's passed burn-in, then we plan to then go through the actual OpenStack installation and configuration. All right, uh, so this is our current way of deploying OpenStack. We're mostly, production is mostly Havana and uh, a little bit of SX. Uh, we are using, uh, ISOS is still in QA. Uh, we're using Puppet with, again, our here data model to configure OpenStack services. Uh, so once uh, an engineer has defined the data model for an OpenStack region, then uh, as you know, like Puppet, uh, depending on like when you run it, like it, it can, uh, you, you need services brought with an OpenStack in, in a certain order for things to function well. Otherwise, you have to do multiple Puppet runs in order to kind of get it to its final state. Uh, so the way we do it today is mo mostly scripted and automated. A person actually goes through the sequence, ma manually bringing up nodes so that uh, you bring up the storage first so that uh, your Ceph or uh, block storage, your glance, all of those images can land in it. The next piece is actually bringing up uh, our uh, load balancers and API nodes, uh, and then uh, bootstrapping the Galera cluster. Uh, so th those steps are kind of a scripted or manual process today. Um, once the initial build is done, then uh, we, we, we don't have to do anything more manually. Uh, so that's the current pain points are uh, it takes an engineer to actually go through the initial configuration to stand up a new uh, OpenStack region. What we're working on and uh, what we ha uh, hope to happen in the future is uh, drive all of that through our configuration management database. Can you hold it? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, we're using an orchestration tool called Rundeck. Uh, Rundeck is uh, used to kind of uh, build out the entire environment. So it's got like a workflow tool. Uh, it's similar to Ansible. Um, it, it's been used internally for other projects, uh, which is why we're using it here. Uh, so we, once you define this entire workflow for building a region, you can have Rundeck kind of uh, build the entire the OpenStack environment for you without having any sort of uh, operator intervention. Uh, the CMDB then becomes the uh, external node classifier. We no longer use Hira, so uh, that manual process also has gone, like where somebody had to build the data. All of that is actually discovered. There's very little, uh, there's very little information that somebody would need to input into the configuration management. 
things like what network blocks we have for the OpenStack region, um, and then uh, like the region name. Like other than that, like everything else is going to be discovered, uh, and then uh, uh, our CMDB is going to tell Puppet how to configure nodes once they check in. Uh, so uh, yesterday there was a really good session on Ansible uh, in the Meridian. Um, uh, we heard like lots of things, lots of the community is like using Ansible to do this uh, same orchestration works. So we, we feel you know, like we're gonna use, we're probably gonna use Ansible instead of Rundeck and leverage the larger community rather than trying to uh, um, build something on our own. That's it. All right. Um, Word. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say to summarize, uh, here's a lot of contact information. We got a lot of good information off of the uh, ci.openstack.org site. Um, just reach out to us. Uh, there's a lot of detail we couldn't go into because uh, our session was limited, but um, you know we're here for you. And also, uh, these IRC channels are great. Uh, toss up some questions. You might hear crickets a little bit for 10, 15 minutes, but someone will get back to you. Um, and we're always looking to start dialogue, uh, continue dialogue about the best way to, to implement this. Um, does anybody have any questions? So it's it's a copy, and then um, yeah. we use like a th that that is the tag within the uh, today like Hira has what what tag to use, like what's the production tag, and then uh, uh, later it's going to be the, our configuration management database will have what tag goes into which region. Like so, yeah. Uh, was your question like on specific to the package repository, like moving the packages from uh, the timestamp queer builds to a production repository, was that the question or? Yeah, so um, so th that part like we are handling through the Repro Pro itself, it does a good job like, so we once we uh, t know that, I mean that the Repro the package is existing and that queer build works, we just directly move the packages to a production, this one. We are not using the same queer build, we're just moving all the packages which was there to the, this one and that's then feed it through the Hera. Uh, to add to that a little bit, we currently, keep a bundled copy of all the community packages and ours, and then we kind of, we have a job that in Jenkins that promotes it to production, which basically tags it in the app repo as production instead of QA, and then Puppet knows, oh, to look in that portion, and this is a, a production version, not a, not a QA version. Um, we're looking at ways to consolidate, because obviously that's not the best way to do things. Um, it's not uh, storage efficient, so we're looking at one copy of the milestone and pull that in as we as we build stuff. Almost like freezing versus the global, which would be constantly pulling from the community. The frozen would be, this is the milestone that we're building for Ice House or Juno. Sure. You talked about uh, hardware burning uh, tools. Yeah, so th that's still in the QA phase. Sorry? So uh, that's still in the QA phase. We use like things like uh, CPU burn or like doing disk, stressing the disks um, to weed out bad hardware. Like memory type of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're also interested in uh, doing a lot of stress testing. We don't do a lot of that right now. Um. Stress testing is mo mostly manual. Like I think Prashant had a slide where in the future we're gonna use Rally to do all, all of that. Anybody else? Yeah. All right, well, uh, thank you for your thank time. You.